You're watching Keeping It Livable, and today we're taking a look back at previous shows. Please stay tuned for this special episode. Everything about buying a bigger place? Just waiting for a visit from the credit fairy. There is no credit fairy. How else will I get a better credit score? Look, you keep your credit card balances low and only open a new card if you really need it. No fairy? There's no magic to improving your credit, but there's help, and it's free. Go to creditfairy.org. This is Keeping It Livable, the program that highlights the people, places, and events in gorgeous Prince George's County. And now your host, Dr. Jacqueline Brown. Today's episode of Keeping It Livable is very special to me because this is the last show that I will serve as your host. After serving Prince George's County in the state of Maryland for 25 years, I've decided to retire and move on to whatever may be in store for me in the next phase of my life. It's really kind of exciting, folks. I have truly enjoyed hosting Keeping It Livable and receiving your support throughout the last six and a half years. Today, I thought it would only be appropriate to relive some highlights from the many topics that we have discussed on the show. The first clip we're going to see is from September 2007, when County Executive Jack Johnson came on the show to discuss his vision for livable communities, from the environment to education, the policies of the Johnson administration have promoted the philosophy of excellence in the overall quality of life for our citizens and residents. Let's take a look as he explains the value of his vision and how it extends far beyond his term as county executive. But I grew, grew up on um, Guatemala Island mm -hmm. and it's just a beautiful place. It's rural. Mm -hmm. um, even today we have uh, no gas stations. Wow. No um, fast food restaurants mm -hmm. and no stoplights. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So you can imagine how rural that is right. as of today. Um, so I grew up in an area where, um, you know, um, fields and water and mm -hmm. beautiful community and, and, and I watched things grow. I helped my mm -hmm. father uh, on the farm mm -hmm. and I saw how you plant and how when you take care of something, it just comes out and, it, and the harvest is amazingly great. Mm -hmm. and it, but it also shows the, uh, the hand of God at work also. Yes. Because even when mm -hmm. you uh, plow the fields and you plant, mm -hmm. you have to hope for rain. Yes. You know, you have to hope yes. for an amount of sunshine mm -hmm. and only the Creator can give you that. That's right. But when you do those things, you see all the beauty, um, not only in terms of your effort, but just when you walk through the woods, you see the beautiful, uh, I remember, for example, I knew the colors of uh, the various birds and the eggs that they lay. Really? So when I came into uh, the woods and I saw a nest and I look mm -hmm. in it, and if the eggs were blue, um, mm -hmm. beautiful light blue with mm -hmm. black spot, I mm -hmm. knew it was a robin. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, you could, and I could tell uh, the birds by the, the songs that they made. Mm -hmm. And I saw all the wild flowers and, mm -hmm. and then we, uh, you know, walked to the creek and we swam in the river and mm -hmm. we fish and we crabbed. And mm -hmm. So that was my life and, I, and it was a peaceful place. And I said, you know... There's a place that, close to nature too. Yeah, and that's the kind of community Mm -hmm. that we need mm -hmm. um, to live and our children to grow up in. Mm -hmm. And so I you know, it was a livable community. That's where I got the term from. Okay. And I said, um, and our children have to live in a clean place. Yes. And as you, as you recall, um, and if you see, for example, that. Mm -hmm. With the children, uh, children planting. Children planting. Now that was the, the concept of, of the beauty. Mm -hmm. For many of them, that's the first time they ever planted. It, it was the first time mm -hmm. that they ever planted. And uh, 
and we we saw the canoe and we took young people yes. on, on the water mm -hmm. uh, because we wanted them to see the the beauty of the earth and feel the the river. Yes. Um, and so that's where uh, we got livable community. That the the community has to be clean, and aesthetically pleasing and beautiful, because it makes people feel good. We sell the intangible of Prince George's County. Yes, there's something people cannot see, but they can feel, mm -hmm. and they can touch, and that we have to do that. Yeah. And that's why we get the uh, the bond rating, because we give a deeper understanding of who we are. Yes. The same way when I'm trying to recruit businesses to this county. Mm -hmm. um, I have to be very honest and say, look, you know, some of the perceptions you have about our county is not true. That's right. You know, if you come to our county, you will anyway. find that it is a beautiful, clean, aesthetically pleasing, beautiful houses, educated people, good families. Yes. You can't, you cannot find that on right. a piece of paper. No, you can't. You have to come. You have to come, you and you have, have to, to see it. And, and you, experience that's right. it. And experience yes. it. Well, you know, I couldn't agree more with the county executive that Prince George's County has a lot to offer. I'm also proud to say that I've been part of his team that has made the vision of livable communities a reality. Now, as you may know, supporting education has always been a top priority for the Johnson administration and a key component in maintaining livable communities. This next clip we're going to look at is from June 2008 when members of the Prince George's County Youth Commission were invited to come on the show. The Youth Commission is part of the Office of Youth Strategies and Programs which provides outreach, guidance and support to government faith-based and nonprofit organizations that support youth and their families. Let's listen to what one youth commissioner had to say when asked how we as a community can help our youth. From your perspectives, how is it that we can better help the youth in Prince George's County? Well, um, I want to hear from you all first, then I'm coming back to the old school okay. people. Okay, okay. okay. go ahead. Mm -hmm. In terms of helping, from the, for helping the youth, well, in order to help something, you must identify the problem. That's true. So one thing in which uh, you want to take essence is that the problem must be identified, first of all. Mm -hmm. And uh, from a youth commission point of view and from a student athlete, is that the problem in most schools is that the students do not understand the points of education. Really? And do, they okay. do not understand the emphasis that society is placed on education, that, you know, knowledge is truly power. So therefore, you know, staying in school and actually acquiring knowledge to be able to progress in society is, is essential in terms of trying to, trying to move on and move forward. Mm -hmm. So once they understand that point in terms of education being so high on the pedestal in society, then they'll understand that, you know, I really need to be in school. I really need to focus mm -hmm. on my work. And, mm -hmm. you know, focus and embrace the good things in society instead of the clothes that they wear right. and stuff like that. So once we once they understand that, then I think we can move forward as a Prince George's County, okay. you know, residents. You know, whether it's talking about stereotypes or peer pressure, one of the things I will truly miss about hosting the show is how it has given our youth a voice that can be heard. We must never stop listening to the insightful perspectives that our youth are waiting to offer us. Now, while we have been thrilled to showcase the talent and the knowledge of our youth, we also like to brag about the Nobel Prize winner we had on the show in 2006, Dr. John Mather. A resident of Hyattsville, Dr. Mather and co-researcher Dr. George Smoot were awarded the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physics for producing the first tangible evidence that has cemented the Big Bang Theory, which states that the universe began billions of years ago. Let's listen as Dr. Mather explains his current project, the James Webb Telescope, a unique instrument in space exploration.
The Nobel Prize is an international award administered by the Nobel Foundation in Stockholm, Sweden, and each prize consists of a medal, personal diploma, and a cash award. So I want to know, how did you first find out that you had oh, been awarded? Well, this is, I got the standard telephone call. Uh, this a is the telephone way, call, get, okay. They do this every year, uh, at a quarter to six Eastern time uh, on that special day. <laughs> you have it down. You get a phone call. <laughs> okay. And so I knew that that was a day that it might happen. Wow. So, but I didn't expect it. I just thought, well, if the phone rings, that might be what it is. Did you put in for it? No, no, you, you don't apply for this. In, you no. can't apply for it. No, you just do your work, and uh, if people recognize it, it's great. You work on very special projects at uh, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. What are some of the highlights of your work? Well, I started off doing this COBE project that you were mm -hmm. talking about today. But since then, I've been working on the Next Generation Space Telescope, which is now named after James Webb. It's the James Webb Space Telescope, and that's the follow-on to Hubble now. Oh, really? So that's right. where we're going next okay. to pursue this kind of subject. So and what are the things that this telescope can do? That will uh, look back towards the beginning of time, towards oh, see the things no. as they were a long time ago. Uh, we look back in time by looking at things that are very far away because, you know, light travels at a certain speed and we can look at things as they were. So we look as far away as we can. We see things as far back towards the beginning of time as possible. So we're looking for the first stars, the first galaxies that formed out of the primordial material. Oh, my goodness. And uh, we also can look, this telescope will observe infrared light, which penetrates okay. through dust clouds and it can go uh, see how stars and planets are being made now. My goodness. What are we looking at here? Is this oh, on the, the screen satellite? there? Oh, that's the uh, new telescope. It's called wow. the James Webb Telescope. And it doesn't look like what you think of as a telescope. As no. you can see, it's, it, it's not a little tube with an eyepiece. Right. It's, um, it's got a big folding up uh, mirror there, that giant hexag hexagon, which is made out of little 18 smaller hexagons. I see. That's the collecting mirror. And the starlight will come and bounce off that mirror and get focused down to make an image. And this can gather information from millions of years ago? From billions of years ago. Billions of years ago. Almost all the way back to the beginning. My um, goodness. So that's what you're seeing here is a picture of a model that we had made, a um, full-size model. Is that at Goddard? Um, I think that was at, yeah, that may have been at Goddard, because uh, okay. that's, uh, what you're seeing here is uh, a model, and the uh, thing on the bottom <clears throat> under the telescope is a sunshade which is about as big as a singles tennis court. Wow. It's huge. And it will all have to unfold after launch because this telescope is bigger than any rocket we have. And is hmm. this model that we're looking at actual, the actual size? Or That's the actual size. Actual you can size. see how, the, how big the people are next to it. My goodness. Um, and when we get this information, you actually can almost read history from the particles and the stars and the things yeah. that you see? Yeah, we can because we see things as they were a long time ago. Uh, by looking at things that are far away. So we don't see ourselves out there. Right. We see other things as they were, and we say, well, maybe that one over there is like what ours was at the beginning also. I see. And so you build on that to say that based on looking at that, I can kind of extrapolate what things must have been like then and how we got to where we are today? That's exactly what we're after, yes. This is wow. the great... Uh, Sherlock Holmes detective story of, sure of, is. of science. How did we get here? It's the one of the universe, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so is the astronomers okay. can do part of this. We can say how the universe has changed from the beginning of time till now and how uh, planets could be assembled out of little pieces or whatever. You, you know, uh, thinking <laughs> about it, I, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to go home and it's probably going to settle on me the enormity, the enormity of what it was and what it is you have done, you and your team have done. Um, and, 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 and I guess what I, I, I want to ask you is, how is it that you were able to achieve this, this work? Um, it's just amazing. Well, okay, uh, maybe I should tell a story. All right, that's uh, always good. <laughs> in, uh, in 1974, I had just finished my graduate school work in Berkeley, and I had done a project, uh, a thesis project, uh, to measure this background radiation, the microwaves from the Big Bang. And the project didn't work quite right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the main problem is that we're, uh, it was a balloon payload, and so our instrument was lifted up above most of the atmosphere, but the air was still a problem. So we said, you know, we could do this a lot better in space. We are so proud of Dr. Mather, and today Dr. Mather continues to serve as Senior Project Scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope. 
And after receiving the Nobel Prize, he was also named as NASA's Chief Scientist of the Science Mission Directorate. We're proud of you. In recognition of his extraordinary accomplishments, County Executive Jack Johnson declared November 9, 2006 as Dr. John Mather Day. You know, we're out of time for this segment of Keeping It Livable, but I need you to stay tuned as we continue reflecting on some of our memorable moments. spirit we're hot we can't be stopped we got the spirit we're hot we can't be stopped we're going to beat them and bust them beat the em. smallest beat moments beat can have the biggest beat impact beat on a child's beat life take time to be a dad today all those boys are much too much those boys your conflict you could fight about it get it out of here ignore each other, get legal advice, or you could use mediation to find a solution that works for you. A mediator can help you talk with your family, neighbors, co-workers, or even your enemies. For more information, contact the Community Mediation and Conflict Resolution Collaborative of Prince George's County. Welcome back to Keeping It Livable. And if you're just joining us, today's show has been dedicated as a look back episode because I'm getting ready to sign off as host. As many of you know, we have always celebrated Black History Month on the show. In February 2007, we had a very special episode that celebrated the life of civil rights activist Harry T. Moore, one of the many unsung heroes who led a 17-year unfaltering campaign to ensure justice and equality for African Americans. He and his wife were tragically killed on Christmas night in 1951 after a bomb exploded under the bedroom of their home in Mims, Florida. We were honored to have Harry Moore's daughter on the show, Ms. Juanita Evangeline Moore. She is a resident of Prince George's County. Joining Ms. Moore on the show was County Executive Jack Johnson and Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan a renowned African-American scholar and founding member of Sweet Honey in the Rock. The clip we're going to see is from our discussion about evidence found in Harry Moore's briefcase, which was recently discovered in an abandoned Florida barn. Let's take a look. Now, this is a late-breaking picture, so there's been a break in finding some documents my dad's briefcase was found in a cow barn 900 feet away from our home in Mims, Florida. It was discovered by a historian who was going to preserve the house, not the cow barn, for posterity. They are opening up a new park in Mims, Florida, and they want to put the Hutchinson house on that park. Right. So they had gone through the house, and then they decided that they should go through the cow barn. They were just about finished, and their, one of the workers saw two big jars, humongous jars, and on top of the jar was a box. In the box was my dad's briefcase, and on top of the briefcase was a lid from a garbage can. They were tired and once said, well, we don't want to bother with that today. And then Roz Foster looked at the briefcase and she said, this is Harry T. Moore's briefcase. My goodness. And so mm. she right away contacted the Civil Rights Division of the state's attorney's office in Fort Lauderdale because it was through her office that the most recent investigation and the only murder investigation was held. 
there's no such thing as coincidence. This, when, when the universe has its time mm -hmm. for things to come mm -hmm. forth, it will be so. Mm -hmm. And it will be in its rhythm mm -hmm. and its time. And this is one of those, this is one of those things. The right person there to be able to say, this is Harry T. Moore's briefcase, think about that. Mm -hmm. And this is just amazing. Dr. Regan, what were you meaning when you say that? Um, as a culture, we had moved to a place where we could take care of a story like this. Mm -hmm. We could have a film about it. We could reopen, the, the film could trigger the reopening of the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when the culture has the strength to take care of its own history and face its history in some way, mm -hmm. then there are things that will come up that no one really thought knew were there just because we made that, that so those in, kinds of in steps. In 1952, the discovery of the, the briefcase may have been insignificant because of the power structure that was there that would have suppressed the evidence. Uh, to some extent, and therefore, mm -hmm. in its time, it has more u utility now yes. than you would have had in... You have to look mm -hmm. at documentary filmmaking mm -hmm. in the past uh, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And these people had to be born. These are young people who had to be yes, born. They had to yeah. be born. To uh, yeah. tell the story, to run for office, to know the history, to live in these communities and say, we have to uncover mm -hmm. these stories in order to move forward. Mm -hmm. You know, many people, including Juanita Moore, have contended that there has never been a thorough investigation of Harry Moore's murder. And on February the 4th, 2007, USA Today newspaper publish an article stating that despite the high-profile convictions in the past two decades, most killers from the civil rights era will go unpunished because their cases were handled with haste. While some of our shows have covered topics of historical significance, we also have had some lighter moments on the show. For example, in 2007, we had a show that featured a personal trainer who actually got me out of my chair and into workout clothes so that I could help demonstrate, oh yeah, designed those exercises that were designed for those of us who are trapped behind a desk most of the day. I sometimes think I'm still a little sore from that workout. In, in December 2007, we brought a nutritionist on the show who gave us some important tips on healthy holiday eating. That is not an oxymoron. As you can see in this next clip, I became very enthusiastic when <laughs> discussing something that many of us continuously think about, fat. On this table are samples of portions. Our biggest battle is how much we eat, portion size. That's yeah. huge for us. So you've brought us some samples today, examples of what we ought to be doing. But before we do that, let me show you what we look like when we don't do portion size. Do you know what this is, folks? This is five pounds of fat. Five pounds of disgusting fat. And it's on us. It's on most of us. If you've lost five pounds, this is what you lost. Right. If you have 10 more pounds to lose, you need to use twice this. You could hurt a human being with this, through the weight of this, it's awful. Yes. This is fat. So we're gonna get rid of fat because Sherma's gonna talk to us about portion control. Just remember this, put this on your table, it'll stop you. <laughs> well. I never pictured myself doing comedy, but maybe it's something I can consider now that I have retired. I really had a problem with that fat. As you can see, we've covered an array of topics on keeping it livable, but probably one of the most recurring topics has been focused on our children and how we can help improve the quality of life for families in Prince George's County. In May 2007, 
we celebrated Mother's Day on the show by talking to some mothers. The clip we're going to see next features Ms. Ivy Fair and Ms. Marita Golden. Ivy is the mother of three children, and Ms. Golden is the mother of two sons. And she also has authored a book entitled Saving Our Sons. Let's hear what they had to say about parenting in today's society. Set higher standards, mm -hmm. give them goals, the challenges, positive challenges, allow them, it's more with our children, and I've noticed it in my, in my own, mm -hmm. that it's more of a psychological, you have to let them know who they are. Uh, Whitney spoke of it earlier mm -hmm. in terms of being, knowing your character, your strengths, yes. who you are. Uh, sometimes it heartens me when I hear kids say that they're lost. What are you being taught at home? What is being reiterated in terms of school? Yeah, we need more professionals. Yeah, in terms of church, I agree. You need to do what you have to do mm -hmm. to support. These just aren't my kids. This is what makes up a community. That's right. And I think that many of our young people are much more receptive to this mm -hmm. than we think that yes, they, they are. are. I mean, the problem is that we don't demand, one of the problems is we don't demand enough of our That's children. True. We don't um, set the high enough goals. Right. And when these goals are set very high, when we engage them in conversations where they're asked to dream big, to think big, many, many times they will respond very, very positively to mm -hmm. that. Uh, but in our schools, for example, teachers need to be given environments where they can actually do that. Right. They need to be supported in the act of teaching, not right. just teaching to the test, That's but right. actual teaching. And, mm -hmm. Go ahead. and have the resources to teach. Mm -hmm. Right. A lot of these kids exactly. do not, and Marita, you and I, we've had this conversation. Mm -hmm. These kids do not have books. Mm -hmm. They should not be sharing books. Mm -hmm. They can't concentrate in school. It's too much going on in right. the classroom and the teacher has to teach inadequately. Right. So I agree once right. again. You know, I won't be here to continue this dialogue, but I cannot stress enough how important it is for all of us to keep these issues at the forefront and continue to look for ways to improve the quality of life for our families. Believe it or not, we're out of time for today's show. And my time as the host of Keeping It Livable has truly been one of the highlights of my tenure as Chief Administrative Officer for Prince George's County. To County Executive Jack B. Johnson, thank you for your support throughout the years. Working in your administration and serving the citizens and residents of Prince George's County has been an honor, one that I will always cherish. For the production staff at CTV, thank you for the wonderful times that we've had while taping almost 80 shows. All of you are top-notch professionals who have made hosting the show an absolute joy for me. And for you viewers, I especially want to thank you for tuning in week after week and supporting our efforts to inform the citizens and residents of Prince George's County. You are the reason and the only reason we are here. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Brown signing off as host of Keeping It Livable. I hope you'll keep supporting the county's efforts to improve the quality of life for our citizens and residents. And most importantly, I hope you'll keep it livable.